Good morning. Wow, that's a fun, I didn't even, did I write that about myself? Leader, Harriet House, speaking team member, and hiker in the mountains. I love that. Thanks, Clara. I do like hiking in the mountains. Well, good morning, everyone. How are we today? Good, good. It's so good to hear. Um, it's so beautiful. I love it out there. Um, so I'm so excited to be here. Um, also a little nervous. It's a, like a vulnerable thing to be sharing a little bit of who you are. Um, but luckily I have like the best people here. So that's really awesome. Has anybody ever seen the movie My Best Friend's Wedding? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You're either like the person in the camp of like, that's the best movie ever. And we watch it every year on the anniversary of whatever, or you hate that movie. And I'm in the camp of, I hate that movie. I know it's a cult classic. I hate it. I hate it. And this is why I hate it. If you don't know the movie, let me give you a small recap. The movie, basically, it's Julia Roberts, first of all, who's amazing. Um, but Julia Roberts and this other guy um, are best friends, and they decide to make a pact that when uh, they reach a certain age, if they're not married, they'll marry each other. And then he gets engaged and she realizes, I've been in love with him the whole time. Now what do I do? And they like go through this whole like heart-wrenching conflict of I love you and you don't love me. And it ends and you'd think like every other rom-com, it would end in them together and it doesn't. And I hate it. I want it to end well. <laughs> what I, it, I don't, I know that's like the more realistic and probably honestly the better version of what should happen instead of breaking up an engagement, but it's fictional and I want it to end well. Um, and I don't like any movies. I'm not gonna trudge through your conflict for an hour and a half and be so um, like connected to these characters if it's not gonna end well. I'm not interested in watching that movie. Uh, but if it ends well, great, I am super happy it was all worth it in the end. But unfortunately, there's a lot of movies like that that I will never watch again. I even thought about watching it in preparation for this, and I couldn't bring myself to do it. I've only seen it once, and I've got a lot of, it's been 15 years, so clearly it's still in my heart. But, <laughs> and it's funny, you know, we laugh about it now, but what happens when that happens in our lives? You know, it's what happens when it doesn't end well? What happens when there's this conflict and we trudge through it and there's not a nice neat bow on the end where we have resolution or reconciliation? And that's what we wanna talk about today. I was pouring into the life of David and we're wrapping up this series on dealing with conflict, uh, which I'm really grateful that we're wrapping up on it, but I'm pouring into the life of David, and what I'm seeing is, um, is this unresolved conflict between him and Saul, and I think David understands that feeling, and, and we see it throughout the, the book of 1 Samuel uh, as David rises to power, and he really is like the best guy. He's, he's, you know, charismatic, he's good looking, he's a man after God's own heart, like marry that guy, you know? But, and at the same time, as he's rising to power and into the calling that God has on him, Saul, who also had a calling on his life, is spiraling out of control. And um, today we're ending, we're ending this series and we're jumping into the very end of 1 Samuel, um, so we're skipping several chapters. So um, well, let me recap a little bit. So we saw, I think sometimes we only see David as like that little shepherd boy in the beginning who then defeats Goliath and then him as king. But what we forget to realize is that there's 15 years of heart-wrenching conflict in the middle of that. There's a middle to his story. Um, and so, you know, we, we started this series seeing David anointed as king, as just a little guy. Um, and then he defeats Goliath and he's helping Saul with his just tormented soul spiritually um, and spends seven years with Saul um, living there. And he is best friends with his son, Jonathan, and he marries his daughter. He becomes family with Saul. And, um, and then, you know, after a while, Saul is spiraling and he's seeing that people are liking David more than him. And so envy seeps in and he um, tries to just ruin David's life and end his life. He attempts to murder him several times. And after a couple of times, David decides ah, that's a boundary for me. 
I got to exit this relationship. And so he, he flees. And he's on the run for like eight years from Saul. And he even has a chance to kill Saul and doesn't do it. And um, so we're going to pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 31, starting in verse 1. This is where we kind of pick up. He's on the run. And it picks up with Saul. And it says... Now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines and fell slain on Mount Geboa. Then the Philistines followed hard after Saul and his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan, Abinadab, and Malchishua, Saul's sons. The battle became fierce against Saul, and the archers hit him, and he was severely wounded by the archers. And then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through it, lest these uncircumcised men come and thrust me through and abuse me. Just put me out of my misery, man. And, but the armor bearer would not do it, for he was greatly afraid. Therefore, Saul took a sword and fell on it. And then when his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he also fell on his sword. So Saul, his three sons, and his armor bearer, all men, and all his men died together that same day. And so after that, um, an Amalekite comes and and knows what happens and comes running to tell David what happened. Um, And just an aside, just structurally of the Bible, um, we have 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. And and what you need to know is it's more like part one, part two. They're not separate. It's one full story. But it was so long that it couldn't fit on the scrolls. So we're going to bleed a little bit into the first chapter of 2 Samuel. Um, And I think... Many of us would initially think that David would be happy that Saul's life was over. I think maybe, you know, he's the guy who's like crazed. He's after his life thinking, finally, this guy is gone, and now I can make this nation what it needs to be. Um, But I think David loved Saul. I think he truly knew the calling that God had had on Saul's life. And he had spent significant time with Saul, and I think it's really hard to not have some sort of relationship at that point. Um, But like many of us, there's this disenfranchised feeling that happens when the same person that we love is also the person that persecutes us. When you work with a child who's been abused by a parent, you have to be really careful about how you talk about that parent because there is a peace in them that still loves that parent. And so if you, t- if you assume what they feel about that parent, uh, they can shut down um, and still try to protect them. Um, and it's this, it's just, it sits weird with you because you would think, in my mind, I would think if this happens plus this happens, then the result is always this. And that's just not true in life. I think that that loving someone and being in conflict with someone, they're not mutually exclusive. They don't just result in the other. Um, and so I imagine that David really understood this exact feeling because when he had the chance, he didn't kill Saul, he never hunted him back. And um, when he found out that Saul died, he tore his clothes in lament. And many of us have had that situation where it seems like resolution won't ever come. We've had to step away, we've had to put a boundary in, or that person has died, and in this lifetime there won't be resolution or reconciliation. And um, for those of you who don't know much about my story, I um, was to one parent, to my mom, I was a miracle. She was told as a young woman that she would never have children, Um, and which I think is one of the reasons my dad was okay with being with her, because he didn't want children. Um, And so then my brother and I came along. Surprise! And um, it was this tension in our lives because um, being viewed as a miracle from one parent and never wanted from another. Um, And my dad had come from generational abuse already, and that perpetuated into my life. 
um, into physical and emotional abuse. And there was this conflict my whole childhood that, that struggled for me being a pretty like go-getter of a human being, either trying to earn it or trying to fight proving that I was worth a place in the world. And so, and eventually, the, the older I got, the more the conflict rose. It, it got worse, and it got worse. And in the middle of that, I became a Christian, and it was this weird feeling of how do I walk out the calling on my life and at the same time have this huge conflict with a parental figure. And it just rooted and rooted and rooted in my soul and bitterness and anger. And what I'd like to say is that things resolved and now we're best and it's awesome. And, you know, honestly, it didn't even resolve in the six months between my dad's diagnosis and his death. And then he died. It just wasn't enough for reconciliation. And so unresolved conflict can be this sneaky thing in our lives that can wreak havoc without us even knowing it. And so what I want us to talk about today is how do we deal with that? How do we find healing in unresolved conflict? And I think from David's story, we can learn three things um, on how to move forward when conflict never gets resolved or reconciled. So the first thing I want to say is that can I give you permission to mourn? David was grieved that Saul never came back and that he couldn't fulfill the calling that God had on his life. And I think he honored Saul and, and knew that there was an anointing from God on Saul. Um, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verses 6, this is where the Amalekite comes in to tell David what happens. It says... Then the young man who told him said, as I happened by chance to be on Mount Gilboa, there was Saul leaning on his spear and indeed the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. Now when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me and I answered him, here I am. And he said, who are you? And I answered, I am an Amalekite. He said to me, please stand over me and kill me for anguish has come upon me, but my life still remains in me. So I stood over him and I killed him because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. David took hold of his own clothes, tore him, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and Jonathan, his son for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. And, you know, I, read, I had to read through that a few times because in, in the last chapter, it was talking about no, the armor bearer saying, no, I'm, I won't kill you. And, and Saul lay, falls on his own sword. But then this Amalekite is saying, no, I killed him. And I think... What I think maybe is going on here is I think even the Amalekite thought David would be happy that Saul was dead. Maybe even thought he would get a reward for it. Um, thinking like, look, David, I got rid of the problem. Now you can be king. You're welcome. And that's just not the case because what I think is I don't think it was worth it to David for Saul to have to die for David to take his place as king and to fulfill the calling on his life. He didn't have to die for that. I think he trusted in God's good timing that that would happen and he didn't have to take it into his own hands. And so David takes time to mourn. He mourns a relationship lost and he mourns for Jonathan. And I think really what he does is I think he mourns for what could have been. He mourns that ideal vision. And I imagine that he probably had this dream that many of us have had that eventually, even though there had been so much conflict with Saul, that eventually Saul would realize how crazy he'd been and apologize and that they would have reconciliation and that then you know, he would have this beautiful moment to pass 
um, his throne on to David and hand over the crown. And then, you know, Saul would be able to give him like kingly advice afterwards and, and that he would get to be grandpa to their kids. And, and it would just be this nice, neat bow on the end of the story. And so David, I think, had to mourn the reality that that would never happen. So can I give you permission to mourn? To mourn the relationship that's broken, the person who hurt you, for the dream that will never come to be. I'm not gonna tell you how to mourn. Everybody's different. Um, I'm just gonna wanna give you permission. It's okay to do it. Just allow yourself some time. And for the rest of us around you, can I ask us to just be gentle with one another? Let's not assume how other people are feeling about a situation. Um, you know, there's this thing that we so often can do because we get uncomfortable with how people are mourning or their situation because it, conflict is messy. It's not fun to be in the middle of. And so, you know, like, Ooh, girl, like you did not need to be in that relationship anyways. It's better off that he left you. That's not helpful. It's not helpful. And so I would say don't try to put a silver lining on somebody's life or don't try to rush somebody through something because it's too hard for you to sit that long in it. Let's just give each other permission to sit with one another in their pain and not try to fix it and not try to rush through it. Let's just be there for one another, of just saying, wow, that is so hard. I cannot imagine. There's this weird thing that I wasn't really sad after my dad died because I had so much bitterness in my heart. But as I've gotten older, what I've had to do is that same thing, is I've had to mourn um, the fact that I didn't, didn't have the dream. And um, I didn't have a good dad, and then he died without any resolution or reconciliation. And um, I remember, like, even when, I, when he was still alive and I would be planning my life, and I had so much anger inside of me, I would plan things like, well, he doesn't even deserve to walk me down the aisle. He doesn't deserve that. And after his death now, I have to mourn the fact that we never got there. We never got to that fact and I've had to cry out and I've had to mourn to God and say, why? Why do I now live with this limp in my life? And even though I was relieved that the conflict was over, it, it really wasn't. And that happens is we think it's over and then it still perpetuates in our life. It keeps going um, in different ways. And um, I still deal with that wound, um, that unresolved conflict every day. And so that conflict has just morphed into this land of what if, well, what if I had done this or what if this had happened? What would my life look like if he hadn't died? And that's a, a place to get lost in. And it's, it, you know, I've gotten lost in it and it's not, it's not worth getting lost in. Um, and so ultimately for me, it wasn't the ending that I wanted at 17. It's not the ending I wanted. I thought I was okay with it. Um, that the older I've gotten, you know, I would have written it differently. Um, and I think David too, he had to take time to mourn that this isn't the ending he would have wanted with Saul. And the second thing that I would say is that we have to pursue healing. And this is an active thing. We have to pursue healing and what it looks like in our lives. In verse 17, um, it says, then David sang lament over Saul and his son, Jonathan, and gave orders that everyone in Judah learn it by heart. Healing looks like a lot of different paths. For David, he wrote, he sang, he lamented, and he got with other people um, and mourned together and found healing in community. Um, and so even though someone might be gone from our lives, that pain can, can still continue to exist. And um, if we don't pursue healing, it, it continues and it will affect the rest of our relationships and the rest of our lives. 
when um, Amy was in the hospital last week, she had an infection in her shunt, and um, it was in like the stomach part here, and they had to um, take it out, and um, there had been an abscess developed, and so they had to surgically go in and clean it out, um, and instead of stapling it, they left the wound open um, for it to heal from the bottom up. And so every day, they had to clean it out, which means they had to unpack all the dressing, clean it, and then repack it. So incredibly painful. But with each day, as it healed, it needed less and less packing. Um, and it got easier. That first day was so hard. It was so painful. But even now, I saw it yesterday, and it is, it's almost completely healed. Um, and that's just within like a little over a week. Um, our healing doesn't usually go that quickly. But um, when we pursue healing, we have to look at those wounds. We have to unpack those wounds. And then we have to clean them out. And then we have to repack them. And, and sometimes in our lives, this is the way grief works, that we have to then think, you know what? I'm doing good. I'm doing great. And then something comes up in our lives, and we have to unpack it again, clean it out address it again, and then repack it. And, and for some really big things, it's, it's our whole lives. Like I know in my life that that wound is something I'm gonna have my whole life, um, and I want to pursue healing. I wanna address it so that it doesn't take a toll on my other relationships. And for me, it took about five years after my dad's death to realize that I needed that healing. Uh, it took therapy for me on and off again for about five years. And, um, and so in that process, I had to unpack it. And I, and I started to realize some of the really unhealthy behaviors in my life. I had to realize some of the ways that that wound had affected things I didn't even realize were connected. And they were. Um, and so for me, I um, had the challenge of what to do with that pain to allow God into the pain clean it up, and then how God's going to use that and how we're going to heal from that. And so that last thing is that choice. And so we have to trust God with the ending. Trusting God with the ending isn't just saying like, here it is, God, and then forgetting that it ever existed. It's actually saying, God, here's this wound that happened. Here's this situation. It's in my life. I'm pursuing healing. But God, let's, let's make purpose out of this. God works all things together, and that doesn't mean that he causes those things. What it means is he's going to take anything you give him, and he's going to use it to glorify him and to further the kingdom. And so for me, I've had to say, like, God, how are you going to use this in my life? It's there. It already exists. Let's do something with that. And so for me in my life, it looks like um, the kids that I work with at school, I can relate to them in a way that other people can't because they have similar experiences. And so those kids can understand, feel understood and feel seen and feel loved and see hope because they see someone who has experienced something very similar to them who's just a few steps ahead of where they're at. And I think that's really important for us because we have things, and you're not alone in your pain. There are other people, maybe they haven't experienced the exact same thing as you, but they can relate. And people need to hear your story because they need to see hope. That's our gift that we can show there's hope after this. You know, I'm not done healing, but I feel like I'm in a really good spot with the Lord and pursuing that, and I feel really healthy after that. Um, and you know, maybe there's a time in my life where I'm gonna have to re go back to it, but those kids can see, hey, like this doesn't have to ruin my entire life. There is hope. And this is something I haven't really shared much, but for a long time with my concept of this resolution with my dad, I thought, I mean, he didn't know the Lord as far as I knew. And um, so in my mind, I was like, well, it's over because he's in hell. And that was okay when I was like 18. And now I look back and I think, I don't know if that's productive. I don't know if that's helpful to me and my belief 
to think that in the last moments of my dad's life, God couldn't have revealed himself to my dad. And so in this lifetime, I'm not gonna have that reconciliation. But I came across this verse in Revelation. It's Revelation 22. It says, then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. And so at this point, I choose to believe and pray and hope that my dad had reconciliation with God and that he's in heaven. But no matter what the outcome is, I know that the promise is that there's healing. And I'm experiencing some of that in this lifetime, but I ultimately know that in heaven, there is full and complete healing. And the other promise that I lean on is that Jesus gets it. And not only with that, you know, what we think about when we think of unresolved conflict with Jesus, we think of Judas, which racks my mind every time. But it's not just Judas who betrayed him. He, it was the world. You know, there was this unresolved conflict between God and humanity for centuries. And even when God came to earth, we still rejected him. And the difference with Jesus is that he took that conflict and he resolved it. He finished it. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness in God that is Christ Jesus. And so that's the other promise I lean on is that one, there's healing. And two, Jesus gets it. He sees me. He knows my pain. He's in it with me. So let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this time, God, that as difficult of a subject as it is, God, you are opening our hearts to some wounds that we have, God, and to some conflicts that we don't know what to do with. God, I just pray that you would insert yourself into our conflicts, into the tragedies of our lives, into the most painful places, God, um, that you would bring healing, God, and that you would, you would show people who you are in those situations, who your character is, that you are faithful, God, um, and that there is healing, and you have promises over each and every single one of us, and you care. And I pray, God, especially for anybody who needs that sp special healing from you, God, uh, that you would just whisper in their ear and say, you are not alone in this. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. James in the New Testament was writing to a church in conflict. They were dealing with people coming at them from all sides. Just before the scripture that we're going to read, he says to flee from the devil. And there's spiritual warfare going on, attacks from everywhere. It says, to draw near to God, to purify your hearts from sin. And it says in James chapter 4, verse 9, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The message version says, Hit bottom and cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious, really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way you'll get back on your feet. So I'm not going to ask you to kneel this morning unless you feel led to do that. But let's just take that posture in our hearts today as we close in prayer that we would just come humbly before the Lord 
because he's the one who's going to lift us up. We're all struggling with different conflicts at different levels and at different times. God knows exactly what you're going through. And he promises to lift you up if you just simply come to him. So let's pray together. Father God, we thank you that you are the lifter of our heads, that you see us in our brokenness, God, that you see the places in our lives that need healing. You are the ultimate conflict re resoluter, the one who fixes the conflict in our lives. So God, would you help us to not take that burden on ourselves? Would you help us to simply come before you, humbly, to offer that pain, that conflict, that difficulty to you? And we thank you, as the scripture says, that you are the one who lifts us up. If we simply come to you, God, we thank you for that. We thank you that you not only see us, but that you have a plan for our healing. Whether it's in this life or in the next, God, that you do bring that restoration, you do bring that healing to us. We trust you and we put our hope in that fact and in you. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, it looks like it's still sunny outside. A good day ahead of us. And God's got good things for you this week as you celebrate independence for our country, but also freedom in him. So would you go and shake some hands, give some hugs as you leave. There's some cookies in the back to enjoy together. Have a great week.